In this video, I'm gonna orchestrate a saxophone soli, along with you. You get to see me do it every single note. All right, let's jump into it. So this video is gonna be a little bit different than other tutorials I've done. And in this case, I'm going to orchestrate a sax soli that I've already, I've written the lead line already, and we're gonna go through and write the other four parts, the alto two through the baritone sax. And I'll show you everything that I do as I do it, and I'll narrate what's going on. This is a new format for me, but I think it, it could work really, really well. So I'd appreciate your feedback. Let me know in the comments whether this is a kind of video that you enjoy watching, or if you'd rather have sort of the more luxury videos that I've been doing, or if you like this to be kind of blended in. Um, a lot of the private lessons I've been teaching have been filled with stuff like this, and I thought it would be great for all of you to see it yourself. And on that note, I teach private lessons, so check out <laughs> my emails in the description. Also, if you haven't subscribed yet, hit subscribe, smash that thumbs up button, uh, that helps me a lot, and there's also links down below for my Patreon. I really, really appreciate all the support I get through Patreon, uh, so if you have a couple extra bucks each month, <laughs> <laughs> Help me out. All right, that's enough of that. Let's get into it. All right, so this is a solely that I've written over <laughs> a, uh, an existing tune. Uh, see if you can figure it out. Hint, <laughs> check out the bar on the top of the screen right here. You could probably figure out what tune it is. All right, so let's take a listen to the melody of this solely that we're going to orchestrate together. Literally the first thing that I do, pretty much always, is I'll close voice almost the entire thing. Now, keep in mind that uh, when we're talking about different voicing techniques for the saxophone section, we've got a lot of options. So there's closed voicing, uh, drop two, drop two, drop four, drop, uh, drop two with Barry, with no double octave and the Barry playing roots. Um, I mean, those are the main ones that I use. It, also, there's unison, octave unison, and two-part writing. I don't tend to do two-part very often in sax solis, and for this, I probably won't use that at all. But when it gets moving pretty fast, and granted, this is a slow tempo, so we could probably get away with orchestrating every single note. On some of these 16th note figures, I'll probably do unison or octave unison, and a lot of times that decision is just based on what range the melody's in. So the first thing I'll do is, um, you know, I might do this phrase by phrase. So in this case, I'll do, I'll do these three bars first. So my workflow, um, I like to just take these, and the, now those tenor sax and the barrier are gonna be an octave below the alto sax. But if we're doing closed voicing, literally the barry sax is gonna end up um, <laughs> an octave below alto sax. So this is going to be the barry sax part, at least at first. So I start with the closed voicing, and if you, have studied uh, different open voicings, you know that they're based on closed voicing. Uh, just you end up transposing certain parts down an octave. And so this lowered, the melody down an octave in a drop two isn't in Barry Sax, now it's in tenor sax two. Um, so they're all four part and they all have the same parts, it's just which octave they exist in. So at this tempo, we might end up using a drop two or even a drop two, drop four, but I'll start by just creating a closed voicing. Um, and make sure that I'm happy with everything that I've done before I uh, modify it to one of those particular orchestrations. So what you wanna do in this case is um, figure out which of these notes are chord tones. In this case, <laughs> we literally can do all three of them as chord tones because it's a B flat seven, right? So we've got a B flat, which is the root, C is nine, is the ninth, D is the third, and F is the fifth. So let's just do all of them. I was going to say rule of thumb, a steadfast rule. You have to leave at least a minor third between alto sax one and alto sax two. And I know that if we end up doing a drop two or something, it's not these parts aren't going to end up being right next to each other, but I still like to start this way. So, so let's put this down on an F. Put this guy down on a D. Remember, we're, we already put this down an octave just so we can read it. <laughs> so we've got B flat, F, D, and we'll put a C in it. Um, then we've got a C, so we can put an A flat now that we had to, you know, forsake before. We have an F, a D natural, notice it's not in the key signature, but, you know, 
it is in the chord, so you have to do it. You have a D natural. When you have the major third on top, you end up having to have the root in your voicing, and that's fine. So there we go, and a B flat. Uh, then we can do an A flat. Oh, it's in the key signature, so there's no reason to do that. We have an F right there. Okay, great. We have an F, D. Uh, you'll probably do a C instead of a B flat. It's just a better choice. Uh, an A flat, then F, good. Okay, now this E flat, um, here at the end of the bar is when because it's it's a stab note and it's on the and of four it's really part of the next chord so this is a chord tone it's the root of e flat seven so let's let's voice it with that in mind so um we've got an e flat and then so we'll skip the seventh and go to the fifth then we have a g and then uh an f and then another e flat good then we got a d flat here which is the seventh so, do B flat, G, F. Notice these, all these inner parts are all the same note, but it's not really a repeated tone because it's not fast moving eighth notes. So this, this will actually sound fine. Um, we are going to skip these two 16th notes for now. <laughs> Notice they're moving chromatically towards a chord tone. So we could harmonize C as a chord tone. Um, it's the sixth. But you can you can always you know make a uh, major six chord momentarily on a dominant chord. It'll it'll read as a momentary like E flat thirteen, which is equivalent to E flat seven. But <laughs> because we can see that these are, are chromatic notes going toward that B flat, it's better to approach them as passing tones. So we'll skip those for now. And we've got a B flat, so we'll put a G below that, then an F, uh, then a D flat. You're probably wondering how I do this so fast. <laughs> you get used, you, you really get used to uh, voicing vertically this way um, pretty quickly. Okay, so you've got an F, which is the ninth of an E flat seven. I might actually go down here and while, while I'm, I'm actually harmonizing, if I, if I find that I'm using the ninth a lot, I'll actually just adjust the uh, chord symbol to match what I'm doing. So we've got an F, then a D flat, good, then a B flat which is that one, <laughs> lots of ledger lines. Um, then uh, G and then an F, good. Then uh, I guess we'll deal with this right now. I was gonna say we'll deal with this later, but um, yeah, so we've got an E flat, so that'll be a B flat, a G and an F, which is actually the same voicing as uh, this note, I guess, over here. Um, and when I've got a repeated note like that, I'll actually grab these three notes and just paste them right here. Um, for those of you that are, <laughs> you know, power users and you wonder what I just did, I just, you know, selected these three notes and held down the option key on my keyboard and clicked somewhere else and just pasted it there. That's not a, spe a Sibelius specific thing. You can do that in Microsoft Word also. Um, but I use it constantly while I'm writing music. So, Make friends with your option key. Okay, so then we've got this voicing, which has an F on top. So we've already done it here. So I'll just, you know, quickly move, you know, drag these notes around to match that. Okay, so that has totally worked. Then this one, notice this B natural is sort of going up toward this C natural, which is the third of the next chord. So we're gonna wait and do that as a chromatic passing tone. So. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll go, that's the third, so we're gonna have to have the, uh, the root in the voicing, so we'll just do that. We got A flat, um, oh, then F is way up there, sorry, we're in bass clef, um, then E flat, and then C, good. Okay, then we've got an E flat on top, so we'll have a B flat below that, Ooh. uh, and then a, uh, in A flat, no, wait, so we're in A flat. We're in A flat chord, sorry, I forgot where I was for a second. So we have a C natural below that, then we'll have a B flat below that, which is the ninth, which is there. Um, and then, because, you know, a, a major six is equivalent to a major six nine, major six nine is a little better, so we'll just go, go with that. Um, and then we need an F, and then an E flat. Okay, so then we're gonna adjust this chord to say, a flat six nine.
which is even better. Okay, so at this point, we've done closed voicing on this first phrase, so let's hear how it sounds uh, <laughs> with horrible Sibelius MIDI. All right, here we go. Two things. First, you probably noticed right away that the very first chord was wrong. Let's check out that again. Here we go. All right, who knows what's going on? <laughs> who knows what's going on? All right, I didn't put a natural on the D. You probably were yelling that into the screen for a while, but uh, there we go. This should fix it here. So let's take a listen again. So if your ears are tuned to this, you probably heard right away that it went unison for a few moments and then went back to harmony. And that was, you know, because we weren't actually done. So we never dealt with these chromatic passing tones. So let's let's do that right now. So these, so basically to harmonize passing tones like this, we just make all the lower parts move in parallel. So in this case, we'll look, the these two notes are moving chromatically down to B flat. So it's C. C flat or B natural, then B flat. So we'll just do the same thing below. So um, we're aiming for G, so we'll have an A flat and then an A natural, sort of moving backwards. We're going to F, so we need a G flat and a G natural, good. Um, then, we've, then we're going to D flat, so we'll have D natural and E flat. Good, so then we then we also have to deal with this one that's moving chromatically, this this one at the end of the bar, that's moving chromatically upward. We just do the same thing. So now we just go one below. So you know, G natural to A flat, it is G natural, right? Yeah, okay, good. E natural, D natural up to E flat, good. Now let's hear what it sounds like. Good. Yeah, it's not that much more. It's basically one more phrase. It's I only did eight bars of this. Okay, so in this case, I'll prob I'll, I guess let's just copy the whole thing down. Okay, boop boop, down an octave, boop boop. Okay, so we're kind of scraping at the bottom of tenor sax here. Um, are we scraping at the top of tenor sax here? No, we're okay. Yeah, it's it's getting there, but it's okay. Um, and that's okay. And I think I might harmonize the last couple of notes on this bar. So we'll we'll come back and think about that. Um, yeah, I pretty much. I, I only really want the last part of the triplet harmonized. So I might. I will, why don't we do that note and then we'll come back and see what octave these notes should be in? Okay, so we're E flat minor seven with a G flat on top. So, so E flat, then uh, D, that's a D, right? Yep, <laughs> or D flat, sorry. Um, then B flat, then G flat, good. Then F is our ninth, which is fine, so I have D flat, then B flat, uh, then G flat, good. Um, then E flat is the root, which is fine. So we'll do a B flat below that. Then we'll do an A flat. Make it a momentary minor 11 with a G flat. Oh, well that's gonna be a problem, but we'll deal with that in a minute. Oh no, we can deal with it now. Let's put G flat, we'll make this a minor nine. <laughs> so we really don't want double or repeated notes on eighth notes. Um, and we can get into that in a moment. So we've got to, we're gonna, we're gonna run into that right now anyway. So we have a, this and then G, then E flat. Yeah, so, or I guess it would probably be E flat. Um, we can fix that one, but that's not gonna be enough. Um, we'll go back to that. Uh, no, we'll do it now, why not? Okay, so the issue is we end up with these repeated notes on the, in on the internal parts, you know, all three of them. And what, and that's something that we really don't want to happen. You probably, have, if you've taken any uh, orchestration class in college or read a book on, uh, you know, big band orchestration, they tell you avoid repeated notes, but that's not the entire story. So basically, if the melody has a bunch of repeated notes, 
in the mood or something. Ba -da 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 -do -do. Like that. Repeated notes are great. Um, so the reason we avoid repeated notes, especially in faster moving figures, but honestly, <laughs> throughout, is because a repeated note is articulated differently than a not repeated note. So if it if it's moving up scalar, a lot of times, especially when you move fast, instrumentalists are gonna slur most of those notes or slur every other note. If you have a repeated note, they have to tongue each and every note. And so it makes blending as an ensemble exceedingly difficult. And you're, you're, you're setting up your sax section to not sound as tight as they can by having notes that repeat, even at a slow tempo like this. So if we can avoid it, our orchestration will be better. Now, sometimes it is unavoidable. And if it's as slow as this is, which is quarter note is 100, and this is only an eighth note figure, no <laughs> sax player worth their salt will have any problem playing any of this. But I still try to write around it. So um, what I'll do in a case like this, the, my first instinct is to figure out which notes are the most important. In this case, the most important one, I think, is going to be the last eighth note, because that is... You know, it has like a, a, a momentary pause to resonate before the next things come in, come in. So if that is harmonized as something other than an E flat minor seven, it's going to sound weird, honestly. So what I'll do in this case a lot of times is make the preceding note, which is the other half of the problem, something else. <laughs> so, um, you know, my, my first go to on, on these a lot of times is just literally trying a diminished chord. So let's do that. So you, if you're going to uh, construct a diminished passing chord, you literally start at the top, do minor thirds, and if you reach the bottom note again, you did it right. So <laughs> we have an E flat, so we'll put a C below it. Then we'll do an A natural. Uh, then an, a G flat. Okay, so we have a new problem, <laughs> which is we've, we've fixed the problem in two of the parts, but this part has a new repeated note in it, which is, again, not ideal. So we can try something else. So um, E flat minor seven is the two chord in the key of D flat major. So A flat seven is the five chords. So we can try doing this as a momentary A flat seven chord. This might be a problem still though, because we're still gonna have that G flat in it. So um, in fact, the only difference is literally this one note's gonna become an A flat or maybe a B flat, which introduces a new problem. So, um, in this case, maybe we, you know, have to fudge it a little bit. So, um, well, no, that, that's still not going to work. Let me see. So, <laughs> we could do voice crossing, but I really hate voice crossing. Maybe there's a better way to do um, this preceding chord as well. What if we do this one also as a passing chord? Oh, I clicked the wrong thing. What if we do this chord also as a diminished chord? So let's do that. <laughs> so we got an F, uh, then we need a D natural, uh, then a B natural, uh, then an A flat. So now we've we fixed the problem structurally. Now the problem is, is it going to sound fine? So let's listen. Sounds okay. What if we make this an A flat? So now we've made this, ostensibly made this particular moment, instead of making it a diminished chord, now it's harmonized as an A flat seven, which is a diatonic passing chord. See if that fixes it a little bit. That actually feels pretty good to me. Let's see if this one tenor sax part is awkward. Oh, well, there's a problem too. This needs to be a G flat. <laughs> Good. I actually like that. I'm fine with that. So let's leave it. Good, good, good. Okay. Now notice we're getting up to the top of the tenor sax range here. So we are probably going to use a spread voicing. So I'm going to kind of blast through this next part. So we're going to continue doing uh, closed voicing here. We're going to ignore these passing chords, these, these chromatic notes for the same reason that we did it earlier. So, um, so now we're on A flat seven, so we've got a third on the top, so we're gonna do an A flat, 
a G flat, which is up here, <laughs> and an E flat. Good, then we've got an E flat in the melody, so we're gonna have a C, then a B flat, and then a G flat, okay? We have a C in the melody, which is the third. Actually, this is literally, oh no, this is A flat. Oh, the old treble clef, bass clef switch, okay. So this is an A flat in the top, so we're gonna have an E flat below it. Uh, C, and a B flat. Good, that's fine. Uh, then we got this weird note, <laughs> which we're gonna actually consider a, uh, we're gonna do it as a chromatic passing chord, a chromatic planing chord down to the next one. So we have a root here. Now notice this measure is all a bunch of little neighbor tones. Um, which is, uh, which is fine. And just think of each of these as like a quarter note with a little neighbor tone in the middle of it. It's probably the easiest way to think about a phrase like this. We have a D flat. It's D flat major. So we're going to have an A flat below that. Uh, the G natural in the middle, which I guess is what it is anyway. Good. We had an F below that. An E natural in the middle of it. Um, and then an E flat below that with a D natural in the middle of it. Um, Okay, then we've got a third on the top, so, nope, a D flat to a C. Um, sorry that this is getting kind of cramped. Here, we'll fix that right now. Get the appearance. Oop, all right. So then we've got a, a C natural. There we go, to B natural, good. Um, we need an A flat to a G natural. Good. Okay. And then this is where it should be, of course. All right. Then we've got an A flat here, so we need an F below it. Uh, and then an E flat below that. And reset note spacing. Good. And then a C. Good. Okay. Then we got a C natural. Now, by the way, notice that in the, the first voicing, we started on D flat and we had to skip the seventh. Um, the internal parts are going to be the same. So we're going to have a C, then an A flat, then an F, then an E flat. So we can just copy these over. Boop. All right. Uh, then we've got an, a B flat on the downbeat, which is a, um, a sixth. So we'll do this as a momentary. Um, D flat six nine probably. So we have to skip the fifth because it's too close to the melody. So have an F, then an E flat, uh, then a, uh, oop. That is the six. So I guess we're gonna have a root in it and that's fine because we skipped the fifth. All right, great. Then we got this long chromatic dealy <laughs> um, and we're gonna harmonize this, which is showing up as an E flat, but it's really an F sharp. Or no, it is an E flat. Why did I put an E flat here? Did I get the chord wrong? It's a D flat six. And I can obviously make it a six nine if I've got a ninth in the melody, so let's just do that. All right, got D flat, then I got a B flat, uh, an A flat. Uh, then an F. Good. Let's see what that chord sounds like. Beautiful. Good. Okay, so now we've harmonized. Um, well, let's hear what this measure sounds like. All right, here we go. Okay, so now we now have to worry about our passing chords. Um, so in this case, these little chromatic dealies um, <laughs> are going to move up to where they're going, so it's a G natural, G flat, I'm gonna do it like that, good. Good. So we should have. Oh, that's right, we're gonna make this a half step above where we're heading. So let's see what that sounds like. I don't, I'm not actually sure if that's what we're gonna want, but we'll start with that. So, 
A natural, I guess. Uh, G flat. E natural. Okay, let's see what that sounds like. Good. Then we have this long chromatic figure. So in this case, we can literally make everything move in parallel. Just we're we're, vo we're going to base this entire harmony off of reaching the the gold note pitch. So the way I like to do this in Sibelius is is literally one part at a time. So this one we've got a D at the end of it, but it this last note is going to have to actually be an A natural. So that's transposing down a fourth. So if you push Shift T, you get the transpose tool, and I'll go down a perfect fourth and I always turn off use double sharps and flats um, it might and notice it everything's cramped together so we'll reset note spacing um, these might not be ideal all the time so I've got a flat a um, we can make that a B flat and make this one a, a D flat and make this one an E flat sorry the things are jumping around um, so there are going to be enharmonic problems in there but notice it did actually do the transposition correctly so then we'll copy this over here um, and we want this one to land on a G natural. Right now it's landing on an A natural, so we'll go down a major second. Boop. Now that's correct. And then we'll copy this one down to the next part. And we've got a G, but we want it to land on an E natural, so that's a minor third. So we'll transpose down a minor third. Okay. So our enharmonic stuff is still a disaster, but. Remember, when we're talking enharmonic spelling, we're really dealing with the transposed parts. So we push uh, Command Shift T, or yeah, we get the transposed parts, and notice that that we've introduced infinity new problems with enharmonic spelling. So that's something that I would fix on cleanup, not in necessarily while I'm composing. So um, this should be correct now. In fact, let's listen to it. Here we go. Good. Oh yeah, live playback, live tempo. The bane of everything. I don't know what it does and I don't want to know what it does. I do want to know what it does, but I'm, you know. Okay, so I wanted to harmonize at least this last um, note of the run because it it's a, you know, crum I guess it's an A flat. Maybe not. I don't know, let's see what it sounds like. kind of want to harmonize that whole beat four. Let's do it. <laughs> okay, so we've got a B flat. We're, remember, we're, we're A flat six nine. So we've got a B flat. So we need an F, then an E flat, then a, um, a C. Gosh, this is so cramped. Why is it doing that in this mode? I usually, honestly, it, it, Separate from these tutorials, I almost never um, at, write in panorama. Um, so it's, it, I'm sort of surprised that it crunches notes together like that in panorama mode. That's a, a little annoying. Okay, so that's harmonized. We got uh, the ninth on top, or the third on top, sorry. Um, so we have an A flat, then an F, then an E flat. Good. Then we've got a D, which is a non chord tone. Or a D flat, which is the fourth, so it's a super non chord tone. So let's just do it as a uh, diminished passing chord, or we can do it as a um, uh, an E flat dominant chord. Let's do that. Oh yeah, let's see what happens. So we got a a D flat, then we need a B flat, then a uh, a G natural. And then probably an F. Yeah, that feels good. We can do this as the same thing. Um, so we got an F, then a D flat, then uh, a B flat, uh, then a G flat, or a G natural, sorry. Um, then we've got an A flat here, which is really just an A flat major chord again. So we'll do major six, so we'll put an F on it. Um, then an E flat. Never I'll do it like this. <laughs> um, and then a C natural. Okay, so this should actually sound good now. Let's see what it sounds like. All right, so 
So now we've we've done this entire eight bar solely as closed voicing, but we're, so we're, we've done the really hard part, to be frank. But let's uh, let's polish it up a little bit. So in the tempo that we are, I think we'll get a little bit bigger of a sound if we use spread voicing. So remember, I, this is going to look a little scary. I'm going to start by we'll, we'll 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 deal with the first three bars first because that's kind of one phrase. The second four bars is a one bar pickup. So. We'll deal with that as part of it, I guess. So I'm going to delete the berry part. Now remember the berry part is just the alto sax one part down an octave. So we still have that part <laughs> written. I haven't really deleted any unique information. So in order to do a drop two, we take uh, the, what was the alto sax two part, put it in the berry sax and drop it an octave. So now this is lower than one octave below the melody. Um, so now we can delete this part. <laughs> and grab these two and move them up one, boop. And then we'll take the, the melody and put it in tenor sax two, down an octave. And here's how it sounds as a drop two. I kind of really like that. Um, so let's keep it. <laughs> and we can try a different thing on the next phrase because notice the melody gets higher or even, even higher here where it hits an A flat. I guess it is right before that too. So the higher the melody goes, the more spread of a voicing that you can afford to use. <laughs> you need to have a slow tempo to use any spread voicing, but we're at a slow tempo and now we've got a really high melody. So we can, we can do a, uh, a thing. So I'm going, and we're gonna deal with these first um, three beats as, it's, as a separate thing, because remember those are all in octave unison. So let's delete this <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's uh, now we kind of at least want to go through here because that, uh, let's just go all the way through until here and then we can decide what to do with the rest of it. Okay, so we're gonna deal with all of this as one phrase. I generally don't like to switch orchestra orchestration techniques. I don't like to switch voicings midstream. <laughs> Don't, don't change horses in the middle of a stream. Um, no, I don't like to change uh, voicings in the middle of a phrase um, because it, it creates new problems uh, on the inner parts. So I'll choose one and kind of stick to it through the entire musical phrase. This big, you know, 16th note walk up to that last note is kind of its own, is, that's the pickup to the next musical phrase essentially. So um, and this pickup is octave unison, and we'll decide what octave each part's going to play those two beats in based on what range their parts end up being after we do the spread. So this is going to be a little bit trickier. <laughs> so in drop two, drop four, um, the first thing we need to do is drop the four. So we'll take this tenor sax part, put it in the berry part, but put it down an octave. Okay, then, actually before we do any of this, Let's save it, because if I hate this, I want to be able to go, go easily get it again. And I didn't grab the whole thing. I need that last eighth note. Okay, so we'll take this, put it down an octave. So now, we let, just so we remember what we're doing, we can delete that one now. Okay, so then we're going to take the alto sax two part and put it in the tenor two part down an octave. Good, 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 good. The ranges are looking excellent. Just. Um, then we're going to take this tenor sax one part and put it up in the alto two in the exact octave where it was. Um, and now we're going to take the melody and put it an octave down in the tenor sax one part. Now notice an, an octave down from the melody is still higher than our new tenor sax two part. Um, so this is a, a big wide spread. Um, but let's see how it sounds. I kind of like that. How do you guys feel about it? I feel really good about it. Okay, so now we want to move these parts into octaves that, so if we move this down an octave, it's way too low. So we might, see, that's actually okay. I mean, it's got some big leaps in it, but saxophone's nimble. That's a little awkward. So maybe we can bring this whole thing down an octave. Now we're scraping at the bottom of tenor sax at the beginning of that. We do that one up. Then this one down, that's, 
you know, we have more than an octave leap right here, which is kind of crummy. Do something like that. I just don't like it. Oop. We can do something like that. That's probably okay. We can do that in this one as well. And then Barry Sachs just plays the whole thing in the low octave. That probably will... This will sound good. It's just whether those tenor parts are too awkward to play. I like that a lot. Okay, so now... When dealing with this last part, <laughs> let I've got an idea. So what I want to do on this one is actually do an even more spread voicing that I like to do, which is um, <laughs> I'm actually going to invent a new part. So the Barry Sax is going to land on a D flat there, <laughs> which is one of their lowest notes. Um, C is the very lowest note on Barry Sax, um, low C below the, the, the staff right here. And in fact, if we go to transpose, notice it's a B flat. And the lowest note on Barry Sax, they, if you ask a Barry player, is a low A if they have a modern Barry Sax. If not, you know, this B flat is their lowest note. So it's a safe note. It's going to sound amazing whenever they play it. So remember that this Barry Sax part is literally an octave below the melody. So we can just get rid of it. Um, and then I'm going to make a drop two out of the rest of this. So. In order to have space to copy and paste, I'm actually just going to delete that as well. And hopefully Sibelius will stop moving around. I'll just do this. Okay, so we're going to take the alto sax 2 part, move it down an octave, boop, there. Then we'll take, <laughs> I guess, literally all three of these parts and move them up, boop. Oh, we're getting too low for tenor right there. I think it's okay, though. Yeah, let's just roll with it. I mean, we're, we're, at, we're in the low part of the instrument there. But I think it's okay. Um, so we'll delete this. We'll put the low D flat on there. Yeah, we don't actually need the flat on it. Um, we're going to take this and make it a quarter note with a staccato because an eighth note with a staccato is not something that you see on jazz band parts. Um, all right, let's take a listen to how this sounds now that we've changed the voicing. Yeah, and that's like a beautiful resonant voicing at the end um, where we've got a nice spread of more than an octave between the melody and the tenor two. And then we've got Barry Sax way down below. And just to kind of finish us off, <laughs> man, I've been going a long time. Um, this will probably be a half hour video on an eight bar sax soli. But, you know, that's the way we roll over at the Pandemonium Big Band <laughs> YouTube tutorial channel. <laughs> oh, my goodness. All right. Um, I don't know about you, I live for this stuff. Let's take a listen. So just a quick reminder, we have a, a, a vanilla, vanilla cakes, um, vanilla wafers uh, drop two for the first three bars. Uh, then we've got some octave unison um, in the beginning of this phrase. Then we're in drop two, drop four for most of the second phrase. And then at the very end, we switch to a drop two with no lowered melody. So we've omitted that part entirely so that we can land on this D flat. And if you're wondering why I didn't write a chromatic scale going up to that D flat, it's, be it's because there literally aren't notes on the instrument to support that. So um, that's kind of a concession that I made. Let's take a listen to the whole thing. Thanks for coming along with me on this uh, journey. I hope that you enjoyed seeing how I approach harmonizing lines like this. I personally would get a lot out of watching uh, other arrangers do this kind of process. People approach these um, differently than each other. A couple of parting thoughts. Uh, don't be afraid to use what we consider like boring uh, orchestrational uh, techniques. So a drop two has that doubled melody in it. That is a huge superpower of drop two as opposed to kind of free forming 
a voicing. Uh, that doubled melody is kind of what glues the saxophone section sound together and makes the, your ear pull out the fact that that is the melody in the other parts of the harmony because it has double weight. So there's a reason that those techniques have become the techniques that you use when orchestrating a big band. Um, so don't avoid them in the name of hipness. Uh, make your melodies hip. Choose hip harmony. Choose hip chord changes and chord substitutions. Uh, but then make the actual orchestration simple and solid. Uh, that's my advice to you as, uh, as arrangers. So that's, that's the way I do it. You just watched me actually orchestrate a thing that I wrote. I uh, hope you enjoyed that. Uh, don't forget to hit subscribe if you enjoyed this. Um, I'm going to put a bunch of names on the screen at the end, and those are my current Patreon supporters. Uh, I can't thank them enough. If you enjoyed this, maybe I'll do another one soon. So with that, <laughs> goodbye. Goodbye.